Welcome everybody. I'm Walter Isaacson. It's good to have uh, Josh here. Everybody knows Josh Wano, I'm, I assume, but he's written uh, this great book, What Excellent Community Colleges Do. A while back at the Aspen Institute, we were uh, asked by quite a few people, uh, I'm not sure all the funders and donors, so I don't want to get myself in trouble, uh, to really focus on community colleges as part of our education uh, look, we do a prize for the best uh, community college each year. I've met some really wonderful people through that process. But one of the great people I've met is Josh, who is uh, leading this process for us. And so I want to both tout his book, but welcome you here. I should say welcome you here because you're always here, but <laughs> welcome everybody else here to see Josh and to get to know this book. Um, wh why should we pay attention right now to community colleges? Yeah, I, I think I mean, there's sort of a renaissance right now, Walter. Um, we've seen over the last six, seven years, community colleges rise in, in uh, getting more public attention. I think there are a lot of reasons for that. One is, um, as the economy turned down, mm -hmm. community colleges, you know, they're lower, they're lower cost for families. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people have been turning to them. Uh, they've been growing over the last 15 years at four times the rate of, of four-year colleges. And, and today they educate 13 million students. And that's, mm. that's, just think about that, right? That's 4% of the American population are today in community colleges, 7 million who are uh, looking for degrees and another 6, six million who are doing a number of other things, uh, catching up on um, what they should have gotten in high school, um, uh, getting workforce training that's uh, not on the credit side. So I just think in sheer numbers, people mm. are realizing that uh, community colleges are, uh, are incredibly important. You know, um, <clears throat> there seems to be a cycle or wave of things. Community colleges used to be called trade schools and they used to really do skills to the workforce. Uh, then they became a little bit more of a liberal arts colleges but junior colleges and now we seem to see a push back towards making them deal with the workforce issues we need. Is that right? Well I think that you're right that the attention has been on the workforce side but they absolutely are doing both. Right. So 80% of students when they enter community college report that their goal is not a two-year degree but a four-year degree. That's 80% mm -hmm. of the students who go in have as a goal a four-year degree. And unless you happen to be in Florida or, you know, there are a few community colleges that offer four-year degrees, you're going to have to transfer on. Mm -hmm. so, so even though we're focusing on workforce, which is hugely important, and we can talk about why that is, mm -hmm. I think we have to remember that community colleges have long been sort of on the, on the credit side, had these two core functions. They're training people directly for jobs like manufacturing and auto mechanics and welding and mm -hmm. uh, there are a host of things uh, that are sub-nursing degrees in healthcare. And they're also really the first two years of a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. How many do transfer? Well, the data show that in, in s from six years, uh, uh, within six years of entering the community college, only 15% mm -hmm. have a bachelor's degree. So if we believe that 80% really are aiming there, and, and we can talk about right. whether that's, that's the right number, that's probably, uh, and then we look at 15% getting one, we're probably leaving four million, four and a half million students on the table. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Four and a half million Americans who come to college with an aspiration that isn't being met. I think that's one of the challenges that we've got to meet. Uh, when you're giving out the prizes for the best community colleges, how do the best ones get that number up from 15% to say 50? Yeah, so it, it's a great question, and uh, when we look at places like Valencia College uh, in Florida, in, in, in Orlando, Florida, now, just to set the context, a lot of us um, have a somewhat nostalgic view of higher ed. You know, where we went to college is what college looks like. Right. Um, but this is um, a college of 50,000 full-time equivalent students, 80, 70 or 80,000 students overall. Huge. It's on four campuses. 43% 40, of these students are African American or Hispanic. And we're talking mm. really about... Have they won our prize before? And they were the winner of the prize in 2011. So what did they do? What, what enabled them to get there? Well, in, in uh, about eight years ago, they developed a guaranteed arrangement with the University of Central Florida. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they're more transfer oriented than vocationally oriented. And what they said is, look, if you come to Valencia and you get a bachelor's degree, you are guaranteed admission to, the, to Valencia College. Mm -hmm. um, over six subsequent years, students started to realize that that was the case. Students who either couldn't get into the University of Central Florida mm -hmm. uh, as freshmen, because it has a 1200 average SAT score, or they couldn't afford four years of a, of a bachelor's cost mm -hmm. uh, for education. So what they did was they went to UCF, 
and we saw a 96% increase over those six years in the number of associate's degrees that Valencia awarded. So once students realized that there was a pot of gold, in essence, at yeah. the end of the rainbow, that there was something guaranteed for them, they started completing their degrees in much larger numbers. Now, there are other things that Valencia did, but I honestly believe that it's, in some cases, pretty simple, mm -hmm. which is if you've got something tied directly to a job, or directly to a bachelor's degree that's guaranteed. And, and students see, you know, it's not 50 students walking before. There are 10,000 students now at the University of Central Florida who started at Valencia. This is a scaled operation. And when students see that, they will complete their degrees. They will uh, see value at that institution. Is completion the holy grail, or should we be looking at other things as well? Um, you know, we've moved in this country for a long time um, quality in higher education has been um, indicated by whether you can fill the seats at community colleges. You know, can I keep enrollment going? And that makes sense. You know, with enrollment come tuition dollars. I mean, you'd be silly not to worry about whether your seats are filled. Um, but it was like healthcare in a lot of ways that, it, you know, at hospitals, if, you, if the beds were full, that was quality. I think we made the shift in healthcare to realizing that it's really about patient success. And we've now moved in higher education from looking at enrollment to enrollment and completion in community colleges. That's hugely important. Uh, it's much better to complete than not. All of the data show a very strong correlation between completing a degree or another credential and stronger wages after you graduate. Dropping out is not a good option for anybody. But it's also not a complete measure. Um, just because you complete a degree, you know, it's just like high school graduation. I think we woke up a number of years ago to the fact that if you graduate from high school, um, with social promotion, you, that, that high school diploma may not have value. Mm -hmm. So the question is completion and value. And uh, I think uh, what we argue in the prize and what a lot of people are realizing now, and I know Mark Schneider's here in the audience and mm -hmm. folks from AACC who are really concerned about this, is how do we measure value? How do we figure out whether that degree that's completed uh, actually has value for students after they graduate? One of the fastest growing and somewhat controversial things and education is a for-profit almost uh, uh, trade or tech or uh, uh, schools um, is because it's growing so fast that sector is that an argument that our community colleges should be focusing more on doing that which is really turning out people for specific jobs that uh, are available well I think that the for-profit sector has some things to teach community colleges there's no doubt for instance, and one of the reasons I think for-profit colleges do well is that they'll organize mm. courses around student mm. schedules. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our higher education institutions have struggled with that. Mm -hmm. uh, for-profit colleges also, when they see a gap uh, in, in the labor market, they can quickly develop programs. At, at colleges, there's a process for doing that, mm -hmm. and it can be slower. It's a very participatory, decentralized decision-making process that sometimes can stand in the way of quick turnaround for new kinds of programs. Um, so I do think that there are some things to be, to be learned by community colleges. But, but community colleges, too, um, the ones that we've looked at, let's look at Walla Walla Community College. I mean, in the late 90s, they were in a rural community that was um, in deep trouble. A lot of the high-value agricultural production had moved out of mm -hmm. rural America into Mexico in the wake of NAFTA. And they looked and said, we can't provide for our students if we keep focusing on traditional agriculture. So they built, they doubled the size of the nursing program. They looked at where the demand mm -hmm. was, and they doubled the size of the nursing program. That's not easy, because it costs a lot of money to do. They built a wine, the first winemaking program that was hands-on in the country. Now they've got 170 vineyards in the area. They had seven at the time in, in the year 2000. So they're now looking at wind energy. So community colleges can be nimble. We've got great examples of that. Um, and I do think that, uh, that that's something that Americans are looking for. You know, they want to make sure their investment leads to something real at the back end. The book has a few other examples of how they accomplish learning and labor market goals. Um, do you have a few you want to tout? Sure. Um, well, in addition to Walla Walla on the labor market side, and um, the one other thing I would mention on the labor market side is it's very hard to close a program at a college generally, community colleges as well. And we all know this. Budgeting is all about um, uh, everybody sort of getting their incremental improvements. Mm -hmm. As long as things are enrolled, people will continue to maintain those programs. Okay. At Walla Walla, they, they, they've closed a culinary arts program and a carpentry program because they looked at the data. They had students in the classroom, mm -hmm. 
But they looked at the data and students weren't getting jobs that, that were strong jobs. And so they closed those programs. So I would say in addition to being responsive to the labor market on the positive side. That's interesting. Yeah. You really have to be willing to uh, close programs. Do we have good so. data like that and do we measure our community colleges on what percentage got real jobs? Well, that's, that work is starting. There's a big dispute right now about um, uh, how much we ought to do that. Uh, look. What's the dispute? Well, the dispute is, I, I think there are a few, few components of it. One is that uh, for students who are, for instance, transferring or going on in education, you certainly want to wait longer to measure whether they have labor market outcomes. Mm -hmm. So some of it's just that the data aren't very good and don't allow us to look longer term. But there's a second one, which is that students have a whole host of, uh, colleges serve a whole host of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are helping students uh, become lifelong learners. Uh, they're helping students um, become, you know, there are strong correlations to better health outcomes, uh, lower incarceration rates. Any sort of social outcome you can imagine are strongly correlated to, uh, mm -hmm. to further education. And that looking at labor market outcomes alone is an incomplete picture. Uh, we choose at the prize to look at labor market outcomes um, recognizing all of that because it's what students want the most. Um, it's, um, uh, the fact of the matter is that if you survey students and you ask what their reasons are for going to college, the number one reason is to get a good job after they graduate. Mm -hmm. And if that's the aspiration of students, I think colleges have an obligation to try to make sure, in addition to serving all of those other functions, but to try to make sure that they're making good on that promise. What is the relationship with local industry in creating skills for the workforce? Um, it, it, and look at some of the Chicago examples where it's worked out well recently. That's, that's absolutely right. So, so we have a challenge right now, which is that there's a mismatch between what it is that industry wants and what it is that colleges are providing. Mm -hmm. Now usually when we say that, people think, oh, you want more people to go into manufacturing. Some of it is critical thinking. If you talk to folks in the consulting businesses and law firms and um, you know, a lot of other places, they'll say students can't communicate very well, they're not writing as well as they should, the critical thinking abilities aren't very strong. So we're not just talking about a mismatch on the technical skill side, mm -hmm. but also on the broad metacognitive kinds of skills. And um, I think, you know, corporations in the best of all possible worlds are sitting down with colleges and talking about what the things are that they need, investing in students and colleges to make sure that they can provide what they need, offering real... Wait, wait, what do you mean by investing? Do they actually fund community colleges now? Absolutely. You see Snap-on tools that's providing uh, the tools for students to use, discounts mm. uh, for the tools students use to, to learn how to be mechanics. Mm in various ways. Um, we see UPS in Chicago doing uh, work in investing in scholarships and students. Um, so, so I think corporations having skin in the game both in terms of uh, talking about uh, what it is students need and providing students, uh, providing cash, but there's one other investment which is there are a lot of things colleges try to teach that are better taught in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And the notion of having students go for two or four years to college learning all the theory and then being dropped into the workplace doesn't make a lot of sense. We know that's not the best way that mm -hmm. students learn. So another way uh, uh, corporations are investing is creating real live apprenticeship programs, mm -hmm. joint skills development programs, where they're spending some time in the classroom and some time in the workforce. Uh, we see it in, in, um, in a lot of professional schools have been doing this for a long time. I think more and more colleges are realizing that they've got to get students out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And corporations have to invest not in an internship, that's not enough, but in real aligned uh, uh, workforce development while students are in college. Is there a divergence between the way we're focusing on K through 12 and the way we're looking at community colleges? Yes, and Walter, we, we, we've talked a little. I know that you have spent a lot of time thinking about uh, K-12 education, and it's kind of a mystery. I mean, if, if, if I were to ask you what are the biggest issues right now facing, mm -hmm. facing K-12, you know, you would talk about teacher preparation, mm -hmm. evaluation of teachers, curriculum, the common core, mm -hmm. making sure we have a rigorous curriculum. When we look on the higher ed side, we talk about student financial aid. Um, we talk now about the completion agenda. Mm -hmm. um, on the reform side, but those are pretty far apart. And I think that the big distinction is that in K-12 we're in the classroom, and in higher ed, not so much. And I, I think that um, if, if we're, look, there's evidence that learning in higher education has diminished. The rigor in classrooms has diminished. In students, all of higher ed? All of higher ed. Students are doing less work today than they did in the past. Meanwhile, grades are going up. 
40, 43% of all grades now hmm. in higher education are A's. Okay? So what we've got is less work being done, and we know that rigor, you know, time on task, rigor equates to learning. Uh, there was a book called Academically Adrift that showed us that. Um, I think it was one of the most powerful contributions to that, and we've got grades going up. And, you know, if we're going to solve that problem, we've got to engage professors in the work. We've got to make sure that they know how to measure student learning that they're authentically involved in trying to improve student learning in measurable ways. And we've seen amazing examples of that that are profiled in the book. But we don't do the rigor of student assessments and teacher assessments that the education reform movement is now pushing in K through 12. We don't do that in higher education, do we? Well, not in the same way, and I think it's hard to see clear that we would. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a philosophy degree versus a pre-med uh, uh, degree versus a certificate in welding. I mean, it's very hard to see clear to a common core set of standards in higher ed. Mm -hmm. That said, I think um, we all could agree that students ought to know how to be good communicators. They ought to know critical thinking in all of their programs. And there is a push for something called uh, the collegiate learning assessment, uh, which is about many of those kinds of critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. About 5% of colleges, as I understand it, are utilizing that today as a way of figuring out whether there's growth in students' metacognitive skills. So regardless of what degree program you're in, those are the kinds of things we would hope higher education would impart. Uh, should we have sort of different types of community colleges more distinct than uh, we now have, uh, like I think we used to have, which were some were truly trade schools, some were actually junior colleges, uh, or is it better to blend it? I, I think it's a great question, and I don't think there's a clear answer, to be honest. Um, I mean, uh, look, if you had them separate, when you walk into colleges, one of the remarkable things is that on the career and technical education side of the house, you can have a set of conversations. And then you walk over to the general education side of the house, that, that alignment to a bachelor's degree, and you have conversations. And it's like you're in different places. Yeah, I mean, well, should really you is. be in different places right. is what I'm right. asking. Yeah, right. Um, the, you know, the, there is something to be said about focus about the focus of providing particular kinds of credentials. I think the risk there is that we have a long history in this country when we have vocational ed and liberal arts education of assigning people based on the color of their skin and based on the size of their, their or their parents' bank accounts uh, to vocational ed, honestly. And um, is, is that because we diminish or diss the value of vocational ed in a way we shouldn't? Well, I think we're certainly not investing in it in the way that we ought to in some places. I think that's starting to turn around. But I mean, do both community colleges and uh, people kind of think, gee, teaching Shakespeare is an elevated thing, teaching welding is a low rent thing, so we look down upon it. Yes, and you see that, I was just with our Middle East program in North Africa, um, and the same thing exists there. I think this is a phenomenon that exists um, uh, you know, in, in a lot of places around the world, which is we view working with your hands as something less than uh, working with your mind. Mm -hmm. um, now, one thing to be clear, though, which is that the working with the hands jobs are disappearing, and the working with the mind jobs are increasing. But by vo vocational and technical education, it doesn't necessarily mean working with your hands. You can be, you know, an accountant or clerical or, or technical or information technology, whatever, and you're being trained in a vocation or, you know, a field, as opposed to a general education, which is liberal arts. Uh, so I wasn't making the distinction between, you know, mechanics yes. versus uh, white collar. Right. I, 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 was, I was speaking about the, the, um, the historical sensibility about this. I think you're exactly right. When you go into the John Deere tractor mechanic mm -hmm. program at Walla Walla, we all think of tractors as things that you fix with wrenches. And, yeah. uh, there are 52 onboard computers on a, John Deere, on a modern John Deere tractor. It operates on its own using GPS. There's nobody riding them anymore. Okay? It stays within a quarter of an inch yeah. on the farm of where it's meant to go because it's guided by GPS. I mean, think about that. So think about fixing one of those. I talked to a student who had been fixing RVs. Uh, which, uh, which were much simpler, he said. He said, if you took a van, if you printed out all the manuals we have to learn to learn how to fix a John Deere tractor, and you, you could fill one of those big white vans with all of that paper, that's how much we have to know to know how to diagnose the problem, fix the problem, operate, 
and train people about how to operate these unbelievable machines. So you're right, actually, that even what we think of as traditional hands-on labor, in fact, today is much more technically oriented. And that's a shift that means that, um, that uh, knowledge uh, that's provided in a higher education throughout um, the workforce is, is more Well, important let me ever. express the question the way my father sometimes does to me in New Orleans. Uh, he runs an in, ran or so, sort of has an engineering firm. They build buildings. And he hires a lot of people. And uh, he doesn't need, you know, mechanics and people who know how to weld. He needs people who know how to read blueprints, make blueprints, you know, do a variety of things. And he said that, you know, when he started, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, he could go to Delgado, what was then called Delgado Trade School, and always get really good, well-trained people who knew, you know, how to do design, how to do blueprints, how to read blueprints, how to figure out the parts you needed from reading a blueprint mm -hmm. and put up a parts list, all the type of things you needed. And then he said Delgado got um, sort of feeling that that was too pedestrian, and so it became a community college, and it started teaching, focusing more on not channeling people and to be able to do stuff like that, and instead to be, you know, studying English and history and everything. Uh, and he said, now you can't find people that you can hire out of the community in order to do things like work at an engineering firm and understand blueprints. Have we moved away too much from uh, valuing that career type of education versus general education in community colleges? I would say across the spectrum we've got a misalignment, both on the career and technical education side and on the knowledge economy going mm -hmm. to a graduate degree side, a misalignment between what higher education is providing and what the workforce needs. And so that's one manifestation of it, but I don't think it's unique to career and technical education. Mm -hmm. I think it is also true in the alignment from two to four year colleges, from four year colleges on to graduate degrees and from graduate degrees into the workforce. We're turning out more lawyers than we need, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right. right. I, there was a story on NPR. Well, this is, a great, this is a great example. So last year or the year before, there was a story on NPR about the University of Washington. Right. Uh, and uh, since 1999, it had not increased uh, this particular kind of tech program that it had for programmers where there was high demand. Mm -hmm. Since 99, the, the evidence was that there was huge demand in the labor market in the Seattle area for these programmers, right? This is their flagship yeah. institution. And there, was, there were a lot of students who were not only prepared to enter this major, but actually were tutoring kids mm -hmm. in the freshman year. They were that good. They had 3.6 and above averages, and they couldn't get into the program. So we had this bottleneck where we had jobs available, we had people who wanted them, and the college wasn't able to expand the program. So, yeah, it's not just that we're producing too many lawyers, it's that we're producing not enough of some other things. That, that mismatch is significant. And is that because the marketplace doesn't work well in uh, institutions like this, except for when these for-profits pop up to fill a need? I think the marketplace of higher education um, doesn't work that well, and, and in some ways that's... N in some ways, it's not a bad thing, right? I mean, no, that would be my next question. Right, I'm right. Not yeah. Arguing that everything should be marketplace. Yeah. Well, right, and and you know, we've seen this cycle, for instance, of engineers, where we need engineers sometimes and we don't other times. I was talking to Mike McPherson at the Spencer Foundation. He used to be the president of a small liberal arts college, and he said, you know, they've been telling me this. They tell for 40 years. He's a he's a labor economist by training, uh, an economist by training, and he he said, I've been hearing that we need engineers for 40 years. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not true. So I do think colleges need to be um, looking themselves and skeptical, um, appropriately skeptical of what they're being told. Uh, but, uh, but, but look, if, if, if colleges start looking at the labor market outcomes for students over the short, medium, and long term, and actually seeing whether their graduates get jobs, where they're seeing a consistent inability to get jobs. They need to ask themselves the question what to do. It doesn't mean stopping fine arts programs, but it may mean that in fine arts programs they need to teach uh, artists how to, how to teach, they need to teach them technology, how to open a small business, how to do the kinds of things that will enable you to make a living in fine arts if you don't happen to be one of those people who you know, wins an Oscar. Um, so I, I think colleges, by looking at those data, can decide what programs to offer, but also how to improve their programs 
to align them to real opportunities for students. My last question before I open it up is a big broad one, which is especially here at the Aspen Institute and in Washington, I hope in this whole nation, we are refocusing a lot of what we do for the next couple of years on the, what I think is the great moral issue of our time in our country, which is economic inequality, economic opportunity, why your economic and educational opportunity depends so, is correlates so closely to the zip code in which you were born or the wealth bracket into which you were born. Uh, what is the role of community colleges in helping solve the uh, economic inequity and educational inequity issues of our society? Yeah, I, I think more than any other issue, this probably defines community colleges. More African American students are in community colleges than any other sector of higher ed. More Hispanic students. More first generation students, being the, the first in their families to go to college. More students from other countries are coming to community colleges than other sectors. I mean, this is truly, these are the places of opportunity. They're open access. The average tuition is $3,000. Per year, it may have gone up to 3,500. Those from AACC, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But they're very affordable. They keep their doors wide open to everybody. And uh, they are, in fact, serving uh, America in 2050, mm -hmm. only, only sooner, as John Deasy likes to say about his school <laughs> district in K-12. So, um, so the real question is, uh, how do they improve success rates? So access has been stellar. Now how do you translate that into student success? I think the biggest challenge community colleges are facing is that some 60% of their students come in underprepared. There was actually a report just yesterday in all of Ohio's public institutions of higher ed, 40% are underprepared. So this is not just a problem for community colleges, this is college-wide, but, but they're much more likely to land in community colleges right. than anywhere else. If they're overprepared, right. they'll end up you know, in a more selective school. Exactly. Yeah. And so the real question is, how do you take a student who comes to you with a 10th grade reading level or a 9th grade math level and enable them to get a credential that has value in their lives? And that is the promise that will help bridge the gap between wealth uh, and, and poverty in this country. It's one of the tried and true things. We know there's a very strong correlation between getting a college degree and having a middle class life. And if we don't figure out because right now, all of those populations I mentioned are mm -hmm. performing worse than everybody else, yet they're growing fastest. If we don't figure out how to bridge that gap, I think not just for our moral imperative of equitable outcomes, I think for our country's future, we're going to have a big problem. And as I say, I want to open it up. But why don't you, while people are raising their hands, tell us about your program here at the Aspen Institute, how it started, what it does. Yeah, so the College Excellence Program actually started with the Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence. And as you mentioned, that's a million dollars every other year for the best community colleges in the country. That was actually not the idea of Aspen. It was brought to us by the Joyce Foundation, Lumina Foundation, Bank of America Foundation, Kellogg. Uh, Bloomberg has been, has been uh, funding, no, uh, but, yeah, but yeah. Bloomberg as well has, has been a funder in past years. Um, and, and they really uh, believed that community colleges needed to be elevated. So a lot of our work... Um, and and uh, as, as we've built the team that um, has done this great work, I see a number of them, Tiffany. Why don't you stand up? Tiffany, are you? Yeah, there's Tiffany, Tiffany in the here. back. Yeah. Lee Arsenault is here. Mark yeah, Brown. Lee, I met. Yes, um, yeah. And uh, uh, Eric is, I think, not, yeah. not here today. But, but as we built this program, I think what we've tried to do is figure out how do we improve student success. And um, we've done that mostly for community colleges. Uh, we're now really interested in the college presidency. Um, we issued a report called Crisis and Opportunity, which tries to identify who the leaders are that are going to enable community colleges to become better. It's one of the things the prize showed us is that you don't have a great community college without a great leader. Um, so we're working on that. And, and we're starting to work across higher education to ask again, how is, it that, how is it that colleges can achieve four things that would make them excellent? We call it the College Excellence Program because we believe that a great college achieves strong learning outcomes, completion outcomes, labor market outcomes and equitable outcomes for all populations. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the focus of the program and uh, we've been delighted to work with our colleagues, uh, many of them here in the audience. On Well, we have a nice building issues. full of colleagues. Yeah. But please, uh, afterwards, talk to Josh or anybody that was just mentioned <laughs> if you want to get involved. I know I've been involved with Colorado Mountain College, which is a community college out in the valley and, uh, you know, near Aspen. And it's just been amazing watching as they create things like new media schools, digital technology schools, uh, how it does transform, you know, kids who probably didn't have as equal of an opportunity 
to get a good job. And as I said, my, my view, when I say vocational and trade, I'm not thinking of the person being trained to do a car mechanic. I'm thinking of somebody who really knows how to design a website and has both the artistic skills and the coding skills. And that's what a lot of these community colleges, including Colorado Mountain College, are teaching. Yeah, I think any, you can't spend time in one of these institutions uh, and not be incredibly impressed by the dedication of people to working with students who we really don't think of as our traditional higher ed student. Um, but in fact are the typical student today in many ways, students who are working full time while they're in college. And these are remarkable yeah. young people and, and really uh, I've been incredibly impressed by the, the faculty and the staff and the leaders of these colleges that we visited, the Aspen Prize winners, um, dedicating their lives. It, it really is a place where you can do great equity work in America. That's a great line. It's a place where you can do great equity work in America. Yes, please. Yes, sir. So I'm Mark Schneider. Thanks for the call out uh, earlier. Um, so I, I'm the president of a company called College Measures, and we work with states uh, looking at uh, labor market outcomes. Uh, so first, a correction, because you said that we can't measure long-term outcomes for wage data, but in fact, many, many states can. Texas, we do. Te I, I work with Texas, Florida, Colorado. Ten years out, we we could do that, and um, you know, so we, we are, are actually getting incredibly uh, powerful data long longer term. So here's my question, though. So as more states are linking their student unit records and their uh, wage outcome data, it gets longer, it's down at the program level, there are some lessons that are coming out that are consistent. Um, technical degrees from community colleges are great payoffs. If you know how to fix things, if you know how to fix people, you're going to get jobs, you're going to get, you're, you're going to uh, make money. So the question that I have is that in the work that I do, when I go and talk at campuses, when I talk at state legislatures, um, you find incredible resistance by many, many university presidents. Right, and especially at the four-year level, not so much at the two-year level, but, it, but again, there's some variation there. So in your experience, you have more experience visiting campuses than probably most anybody in this room. So what, what makes a school or a president more receptive to that kind of information? What makes a president willing to go out and actually develop these kinds of industry councils that actually feed back information into the development of curriculum so that they're faster and more aligned with, uh, with, 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 uh, with the needs of the regional economy? Thank you. It's a great question. Uh, leaders need to start with the end in mind, and they need to organize their campuses with the end in mind. Um, there are a few phrases that some of the great presidents have said. One is, if you look at where students are coming from and where they're going, you'll realize what it is you need to do in terms of framing your college. The other is uh, uh, somebody who said, anybody who tells me that this college is a destination is talking hogwash. Right? This is from the South, uh, um, in case you were wondering. But the point that they're both making is that the college can't do its work alone. And the college doesn't, if it looks only inside its four walls, it's going to be missing what matters most for students. So what is the quality of an individual that allows that? It's a deep dedication to student success. And I know that can sound trite. But it is the belief that the reason they do the work is because students need to succeed. And they may not even be students who are on their campus. Maybe students in the K-12 system, so they help create an early college high school. It may be students after they graduate. So when Valencia College won the Aspen Prize in the first year, they got 600000 out of a million dollars. What did they do with the money? They parlayed it into three or four million dollars of a scholarship fund, not to use for Valencia students but to use for Valencia students who were going to the University of Central Florida. <coughs> so the money never even came onto the campus. That's the kind of spirit somebody has to look at what comes next. And I think if they've got the ability to do that, and the deep dedication to doing that, and they know how to work to get everybody on board with that same kind of vision, how to show them the data. I mean, I would like to think, Mark, in every state where you are, that college presidents, with their boards and with their senior teams and with their faculty, are looking at the data and saying, is this true for our college? And you know that the, the data you have are, uh, have some value, but they've got some holes. What we hope they do, you and I both, is start saying, is this true on my campus? And if it is true that some of our degrees don't offer value for students, or some offer twice the value of others, that they, that they are organized in such a way so that changes are made on the campus. But I do think it starts with a sense of starting with the end in mind and a deep dedication to student success. So, so just one quick follow-up. Yep. So again, you've been to, you've talked to more presidents than probably anybody here. So 
what, and, 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 yes, and, and thank you. So, um, and, and I know that this is one of your new uh, uh, thrusts to try to get that kind of skill set, that kind of thinking more widely disseminated. I mean, uh, so what's the right way of phrasing it? How optimistic are you about the future? How optimistic are you that the next generation of college presidents are going to have this mindset, are going to actually have the skill set to make this happen? So um, you know me, Mark. I'm optimistic that we can get stuff done. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we have good conversations. Um, so, so look, from uh, 1996 to 2006, the average age of a college president went up from uh, 52 or 53 years old to 60 years old. Now the lifespan, 61 now? See, there are people who talk to more college presidents than I have and know the data better than I do. Barbara from the Council of Independent Colleges corrected me. Um, lifespan hasn't increased by seven or eight years over that time. So, so here's the good news. The good news is we've got huge turnover. In the last two years, I'm told by my friends of the American Association of Community Colleges, in two years, over 300 community college presidents have left their positions. That's over a quarter of the sector. So that means we've got an amazing opportunity with a generation shifting out to bring in a new generation. That I, is, by the way, the definition of an optimist who can see so many people leaving and saying that's just. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose it is. Um, I'll, I'll think about that. Um, so, so, uh, so I think the question then is how are we going to change things so that the next generation is able to deal with the incredibly volatile situation we're in, right? More accountability for outcomes, changing demographics, more technology in the classroom. I mean, these are huge seismic kinds of changes. And we need presidents who are capable of leading their campuses to much higher levels of student success. So we're working on in two ways to try to resolve that. One is we're building a set of hiring tools for trustees that align to these qualities of exceptional community college presidents. So there are things like questions and rubrics to use for candidates, their job announcements. Uh, they're actually a protocol for having a conversation before you even start the search about what you're looking for to improve student success. So we're building tools that we hope community college trustees, I see Ji Hung from the Association of Community College Trustees is here, and we're in conversation with them about how do we get trustees to use these tools so that they understand that when they hire a college president, there may be some things that they're overlooking and can better align what they're doing. The second thing we're doing is we're building a new curriculum for the next generation of community college presidents so they understand how do you look at labor market data, for instance? What kinds of measures do you look at? And then again, how do you get everybody rallied around this idea of improving education and, and accomplishing that? Yes. And then in front of you. Hi, I'm Alexandria Foster. I'm an intern from the Center for American Progress, and I'm also a student at the University of Michigan. And um, my question for you is, what can four-year universities do to help with the transition of students who are coming from community colleges to prepare them for the academic rigor of um, four-year institutions? Thank you. And I'm going to hand the microphone right here. Yeah. yeah, to the woman in front of you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So you've identified um, an incredibly important issue. Actually, when I was with the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, we gave a grant to the University of Michigan to work more with two-year colleges. Look, we've got a huge problem, which is capacity at the four-year sector and the willingness of four-year colleges to take the students. And so what I would say, first of all, is get some skin in the game. When the University of Central Florida um, decided to expand, and some of it, it's a public institution, um, and they decided that they would sort of uh, take the lid off of what their enrollment would be, they could see clear to taking 10,000 Valencia students. Um, and so the first thing I would say for four-year colleges is make a commitment to making this work. If you care about diversity, and look, I don't know what's going to happen in the Supreme Court, but particularly for highly selective colleges, um, if they are restricted further from uh, considering race in, in, in admissions decisions, um, I can tell you one place they can find that diversity, it's in community colleges. So it's a, it's a way of, of ensuring diversity That's um, really interesting. Uh, on their campuses. I, I'll say one other thing about transfers from the selective side. Um, uh, the US News and World Report doesn't look at SAT scores for transfers, so it doesn't affect your rankings. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so you can, um, you can ignore what may not be a great indicator of student success, um, the SATs. Uh, and still really dramatically increase diversity. So what I would say is the first thing is get, get the skin in the game. Now, why does that matter? At the University of Central Florida in Valencia, this was not easy 
easy sledding. I, I talked to an engineering professor, at the, a pre-engineering professor at, the univers at, at Valencia, um, who said to me for, for years after the partnership was developed, she had to send a folder of her final exams graded to the University of Central Florida for them to audit to make sure she was being rigorous enough for their junior level class. Now you can say that's uh, inappropriate, that, that the college class, and knowing this woman, her college class probably was just as good as the, the freshman and sophomore classes. Maybe they weren't as good. It doesn't really matter whether it was true or not. If we're gonna create value, four-year colleges seeing value, they've gotta get skin in the game. They've got to start working with the four-year colleges to align curriculum and know where value is created. Um, so so uh, that my advice would be make a commitment to taking um, an additional 5%, 10%, 100% uh, 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 increase in the number of community college transfers uh, that you've taken in, in past years. That will uh, create the circumstances in which you'll figure out what to do. It's a great project for you to undertake, <laughs> and both with CAP and with the University of Michigan. I hope you report back to us on whether you were able to push it. Hi, Lauren Eister from the Urban Institute. Um, in thinking about student success, I've, I've been traveling to some community colleges myself and doing evaluations for big federal grant programs. And one of the challenges that uh, folks on the ground have talked about in either expanding or um, building new programs to be responsive to the labor market is that they have trouble finding teachers, finding instructors, faculty to um, build these programs because the pay is not as good as they could get in the labor market. And I was wondering if you saw any examples of community colleges that were thinking about this issue, especially in terms of thinking about their success. It's a great question. So one of the colleges that's most impressive to us is Lake Area Technical Institute. It's a little college of a couple of thousand students in Watertown, South Dakota. And it has 30 defined career and technical education programs, airplane mechanics, uh, pre-nursing programs, uh, um, the st same kinds of things I'm sure that you're, you're seeing. And, and they, they report the same uh, challenge. Um, one thing I will say is that um, we've got to elevate this function. It's, it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Walter. We've got to make sure that people understand how incredibly valuable it is to be doing teaching in this context. And we have, we have done a disservice to community colleges in, in the past. I mean, to be clear, they need to get a lot better but they're a vital part of the fabric of American education. And not enough people who think, and look at, look at Teach for America and what that's tapped in terms of the number of people who want to go into urban teaching in K-12. Not enough people think community colleges will enable them to have that same kind of impact. Mm -hmm. So one is I think we just need to publicize the fact of how important this is generally. The Aspen Prize, that's one of the goals. Um, but the second thing is that if you can create a great culture in which to work, and that gets known, and Lake Area Tech doesn't have trouble attracting people. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can create a great culture, we know that pay isn't everything. That when people are satisfied with their work, working with colleagues that they like, and they get out of the classroom, knowing that, that they have a 76% graduation rate at Lake Area Tech, 76, with another group of students transferring without a degree. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. When you know you're having that kind of impact with a group of colleagues that you really enjoy working with every day and students, um, who you know you're preparing for real jobs, I think that um, that can stand in, in the stead of it. So what I would say is, as community colleges get better and drive towards becoming better workplaces, more will be able to attract people, uh, but also it's up to all of us to spread the word that this is a, a great place to do equity in America. That's very important, and that's uh, you know why you say we have the community college prize, which is whether it's attracting great leaders to run these institutions or teachers to teach there, or students to go there, the level of respect and uh, excitement around them has to be kicked up a bit. And uh, that's something we all can do. Let me ask you a question along those lines, because you mentioned Teach for America, and we have our big gathering here tonight. Could there ever be an organization, a national service organization, like we're trying to start here, that tries to take people uh, one of the things we don't do at Teach for America, because Wendy Kopp is resistant to it is um, taking mid-career people, 
saying, okay, I've had a great job as a lawyer or whatever, but they're, you know, Patton Boggs is laying off a third of us. I want to go be a teacher or something. Um, could you create a National Service Corps for mid-career or late-career people in their 50s and 60s who say, I would like to train to be a teacher at a community college? I think it's a great idea. So there's an optimistic idea that we can work on together. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're trying to start some National Service yeah. Corps, so. I think one of the challenges in, I mean, just to be clear and not to um, put a, uh, a, a cloud on that silver lining, um, one of the things we have to recognize is that there is a drive towards adjunct professors who are relatively low paid um, across higher education. Right. And, um, you know, there is sort of a baseline of remuneration that people need in order to live. Um, particularly mid-career professionals who are, 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 are leaving. I, I, I think there are some ways of trying to address that, but it is a big challenge across higher ed. Um, the majority of professors now are adjuncts who are, are working on a per-class basis. It's not like it is in K-12 where you, where you really have a professional uh, group of teachers working. So, right. so there are some challenges in, in making this uh, attractive to mid-career folks, but I think it's a great idea and something worth, worth thinking more about. Do you have a question? Or? This question. Oh, OK. Sorry. Um, uh, Brandon Dothager from Wabash College. I'm a sophomore. Um, so you talk about how community college students' main goal is to get a job. But then there's 43% of grades being A's, and there's no stratification amongst the degree. And, and it's harder to get a job uh, with a degree than ever before. So is the model perpetually going to be working against itself? So it is true that we have higher unemployment rates for college graduates today than we did six years ago. But that's because we have higher unemployment rates across the country. And it's much, much worse for those who don't have a college degree. So relatively, in fact, the, the protection that you get with a college degree is better today than it was before. I know that's no consolation to those. There aren't that many students. Those parents who have a a child who's returned home with a college degree living in your basement um, because they can't get a job. But, but just to be clear that uh, a college degree still really does have value um, and uh, remains the best, uh, the best predictor, in fact, of whether you're going to earn a, a living wage um, and, and, and whether you're going to be employed. Uh, I, I think that, though, that there's a lot that can be done. The estimate is there's something like two million jobs right now going begging in the United States because we don't have skilled workers for them out of 13 million. Um, and that would suggest that there's a mismatch. Um, some of it may be regional, some of it may be national, between what colleges are producing and the, the training that people are getting and where the jobs are. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, Did you want to follow up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Judith James from Nova. Nova, Northern Virginia Community College. This is the question. Um, we've talked about community colleges, technical colleges, academic under preparation. I was involved with the Kentucky Community College system when they merged in the mid 90s. What would you recommend for those colleges that are now community and technical colleges that with intention the colleges get involved with to redress this academic under preparation issue, given the distinction between preparation on the academic side, liberal arts side, versus the technical side? Mm -hmm. So I think as we move towards the Common Core standards in, what is it, 45 states, 46 states? Ross is here. Ross, Ross is uh, taking the 45 and a half states. Uh, is D.C. the half? D.C. is there. Right? <laughs> only the English, okay. Minnesota only adopted the English, we, we understand. Um, I think we're going to see. I'll ask you later why that's the case. But <laughs> I think we're going to see standardized preparation for students more and more, regardless of whether they're going on the career and technical education side or the, uh, the, the liberal arts or general education side of, of, of higher ed. Um, look, what, what is it that colleges can do two and four year? We see the California State University system at the four year level doing remarkable work 
with their K-12 system to help more students be prepared. On the community college side, I can speak about a couple of examples. Santa Barbara City College, one of the co-winners of a prize in 2013, realized that um, we think of Santa Barbara as this sort of she-she community and it's lovely to go to. And, but the fact is that their feeder systems are largely Hispanic, their K-12 systems. And they wanted to make sure that those students were eligible for, um, were ready when they got there because what they aim for is largely transfer to the Cal State and UC system. And if they're not ready when they get there, the chances they're going to make their way all the way through a two-year degree and then to a four-year degree go way down. It's one thing to get people ready and put them through a one-year certificate program in welding, uh, but it's another to think about getting somebody ready and going two plus two, right? And so what did they do? They worked with their K-12 system. They co-developed something called, uh, um, I can't remember the name of the program, but it's a, it's a curricular program starting with eighth graders that they co-developed and actually provide funding for the delivery of in the K-12 system. And they work, they have monthly meetings with the K-12 system to see how students are on track. And they're teaching students study skills. They're teaching them to have a plan for completing high school with a rigorous curriculum. They're teaching them how to uh, think about a plan to pay for college so that they understand in eighth grade. We see that with a lot of first generation students, if you talk to them about the financing of college in the mm -hmm. 11th or 12th grade, they say, I can't afford that. I can't afford $20,000 uh, or whatever it's going to cost. Um, so they're working earlier on. And second example is Harper College outside of Chicago. Harper College looked at their data and they saw that the biggest predictor of whether students got degrees was whether they were ready in math when they arrived. And a lot of colleges, to their credit, would look and say, we need to revamp the math remedial program to make sure that that works better. They're doing that. But they also said, what if we could get more students math ready? So they created a new nonprofit organization, Harper College and the three feeder school systems. They each pitched in a quarter of a million dollars to create a there, a new entity whose job it was, was to figure out what the misalignment was and to fix the problem. I can talk about how they did it. Um, they aligned curriculum. They counseled students to take math in the 12th grade, another predictor that, uh, of success that they saw. And in just three years, they increased from 46 to 58 percent the number of entering students into Harper. Now remember, not all of those students came to Harper, but just by working with the three most common feeder school systems, they went from 46 to 58 percent in math readiness. And that will then reverberate, reverberate uh, to the benefit of students while they're in college. Do you think that, um, yeah. Given the cultural diversity at the two-year college level and given the academic under-preparation <laughs> issue, that maybe it's time to reassess the mission of the community college and expand it to, with more intention, almost like implementing common core standards because of the diversity under-preparation, establish a standard of excellence that will really intentionally address, either have the community colleges do what you're suggesting some of the other campuses have done in California and Chicago, early outreach initiatives, which has been going on for a long time, create more requirement uh, within the mission of the community college because of the diversity and the uh, uh, under preparation issue. So, let, yeah, let me, yeah. so, We'll get back to I don't think second. we know well enough exactly what that would look like. I'm, I'm very compelled by the idea of being really clear on the outcomes and allowing institutions to really figure out how to get there. So we look at labor market outcomes, we look at completion rates, uh, we look at transfer and bachelor success rates, short and long-term labor market outcomes, and equitable outcomes. And my sense is that if colleges have leadership that care about those things, and if they're really monitoring, not just institution-wide, although that's very important, but program by program, what those outcomes are. And, and really working to engage everybody in the process of getting better, of continuous improvement, I think we will develop models that will get us to exactly what you're talking about with a diverse population. We've seen it. Valencia College, as I mentioned, 43% mm -hmm. minority students. Walla Walla in Washington State, three hours from Seattle, you know, it's in the middle of rural America. They're 20% Hispanic students. And by the way, they have a huge prison population they work with. Right? They're working with students in prison, and they have great retention rates. Uh, that, that's <laughs> uh, but they, they have great graduation rates as well. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. But, but no, I mean, I, you know, I, I make light of it. But, but, but the point is that you can, work with, you can work with people who have 
have um, traditionally been part of populations that haven't had success, or even people who have literally fallen off the tracks. You know, uh, one of the things... Um, and succeed. You said two things. You've talked about the U.S. news being a sort of pushing some of the wrong metrics that you don't really want to have. And you've talked about all the ways you rank community colleges. Do you think your program with the people in this room and your funders could actually create the America's Best Community Colleges list each year and provide an alternative uh, that would um, be an alternative to both U.S. news but would raise the visibility and standards and respect for this sector? So by listing the 10 finalists for the prize and the prize yeah. winner, we are indicating that these are exceptional community colleges that deserve the attention of everybody, whether they be students making selections, policymakers trying to figure out what to do, and other colleges. We're reluctant to say this is the best, and, and I have to say, there are others in that game as well. So Washington Monthly Magazine puts out a ranking of community colleges. They, by the way, have taken our metrics yeah. this last year. They have a certain different them. set of metrics too, though, which they is do. service and, well. and so we are interested in highlighting excellence more than we are in ranking colleges. And uh, you know, I know that may sound a little bit like a, um, a, a distinction without a difference, but the reality is that you have to think about who your audience is. And for us, the audience really is community colleges themselves. Mm -hmm. What we're interested in doing is both elevating the sector and in helping colleges understand not what it means to achieve program by program success. Somebody said to me recently, we have a lot of random acts of excellence yeah. in the community college sector. Right. And I think what they meant was that, that there is sort of, there is excellence. You go on any campus, you'll find excellent programs. The question is, what does it mean to achieve success at scale? And so what we're really trying to do through a very rigorous process with some of the best analysts in the country mm -hmm. is figure out how to measure that quantitatively and qualitatively and then help people understand how others can get there. That's our goal. Well, you have so much resources there with all that. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Or at least conceivably, just publish the 100 best community colleges the way a Washingtonian would be the 100 best doctors in Washington or something, which would multiply by 10 your 10 best or your 10. So we did release just in January, uh, was it January, Lee, yeah. that we, um, our 150 eligible institutions. And that's based on a formula looking at federal data. Hmm. And so that's certainly something that those colleges on that list should be proud of. Uh, we haven't ranked them one to 150. We've said they're all eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just closed uh, the, the application. Uh, and we've got over a 70% mm -hmm. application rate uh, again this year. So we're really pleased that people take seriously this process. And, and I have to say, we, I just, uh, somebody just uh, cornered me at a meeting and they, they said, oh, look what I've got. And they, they, they opened up their phone. And they'd just been in Santa Barbara. Actually, there's another one of our program directors, mm -hmm. Charlie Firestone. And he, and he showed me a banner, and it said, Santa Barbara City College, number one in the country. Uh, they have banners all over campus because right. they won the prize last year. So right. clearly the colleges feel great pride, in, and as they should, in, in this accomplishment. And we hope, again, that that helps in the same way some of these others try to. We hope with, with better metrics than US, U.S. News and World Report uh, uses. Uh, it helps elevate the, the top placers. That's why I'm pushing it, yes. <laughs> Yeah, the two of you, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Julie Johnson. I'm the Executive Director and Dean of Community Colleges at Strayer University. Uh, so Josh, as you're looking at the best colleges in terms of um, responsiveness to the labor market and improved outcomes, that requires a lot of flexibility, but we also know that the community college sector has um, often has very limited resources and capacity. And so what have you found in those best colleges in terms of holding that tension between flexibility and limited capacity and resources to achieve those ends? So I, I think there are two answers to the question. One is, um, and Rick, um, you might have been wanting to say this, I, Rick Collenberg is here from the Century Foundation and I think has the mic next. I was on a uh, privilege to be on a commission on uh, equity in community colleges that the Century Foundation ran and I think um, uh, was able to uncover some of the, what we suspected but, but I think quantify, some of, some of how uh, community colleges are disadvantaged. So one of the things was between 2000 and 2010, uh, the average per pupil public expenditure in community colleges increased by one dollar. It's flat. At the same time, and Rick, you'll correct me if I got this wrong, uh, at the same time, Research One 
universities. These are the large research universities had a $14,000 increase in per pupil contributions to their institutions. Now, there's just something terribly wrong with that. Even if you separate out the research mission, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And so we've got to support community colleges. In the same way in K-12, when we see disparate funding where, where property taxes go to local schools, and so when you have low property taxes, you have less money, we see the same thing happening in higher education. And because of the diversity in community colleges, we're mirroring many of the same social inequalities in community colleges that we are elsewhere. Um, so, so this is a huge issue. That said, it can't be used as an excuse. And what we, what we see in great community colleges is once they've aligned everything to the outcomes, they close programs. They shed initiatives quickly that don't work. And so even if something's thought to be really good elsewhere, like um, early warning systems are all the rage these days, where you can find out in the first two weeks whether students are likely to fail based on a bunch of characteristics of those students. Early warning that students may fail, and then you can intervene. And it works in a lot of places. Well, I know actually Northern Virginia Community College, where I was a fellow, Bob Templin tried it, um, or it was at Valencia. I think it was actually at Valencia. He tried it, and it didn't work. They stopped doing it. They're going to try to revamp it. But they didn't hold on to something that didn't work because they were consistently measuring and trying to improve. And where it really wasn't working, they knew that they had three other things mm -hmm. waiting to be done that needed to be done that uh, if they kept funding the things that weren't done, that, were, uh, that, that they couldn't fund. So, so uh, Sandy Sugar at Valencia says, we operate from a perspective of, of abundance. To be clear, Valencia has the lowest, among the 28 community colleges in Florida, Valencia has the lowest per pupil contribution from the state, the lowest. And yet they were the prize winner among some terrific community colleges that are there. Wait, so I think yeah. we, we need, they need more resources but uh, relative to others. But there's a, there's a lot that can be done to use their resources that they have more effectively. Yeah, Rick. Yeah, uh, yeah hi, Josh. Um, Congratulations on the book. I'm Richard Kallenberg with the Century Foundation. I was going to raise the same issue about resources. Um, I, it's not just the, the public institutions, the four-year public institutions that we invest more in. Uh, there's also the, the issue of subsidies to private institutions. So Richard Vetter found, for example, that the per pupil expenditure at Princeton is $54,000. And uh, that's because there are these enormous tax breaks that uh, an institution like Princeton enjoys. The, the endowment isn't taxed. Um, when someone gives a swimming pool to Princeton, we all pay for a third of that. And so I'm wondering, um, and, I'm, and I'm glad that you uh, made this point that the community colleges are under-resourced. Um, are there any political strategies you might suggest for, for getting adequate resources um, for community colleges? Well, I think one is to get better. Um, I mean, I don't want to be glib about this, but um, I think that um, where you see community colleges that are saying, um, uh, there's one president who recently said, look, in the last several years, I've gone from a 12 to a 20% graduation rate, which is really impressive, right? That's a, you could say that's a 66% increase. He said, that means 80% of our students fail, and that's completely unacceptable. Where you have presidents who are willing to say that before the legislature and to talk about what they need to do that and talk about what they're willing to cut as well as what they need to improve, I think you start to gain credibility. I also just think improvement. I mean, look, let's, we haven't really talked about community college success rates, but um, the best national data we have shows that within six years of entering community college, um, on average, 34% uh, students, uh, of students have some degree or credential. Um, you know, if you look out after six years, it's a point of diminishing returns. Maybe you get to 40. But they've got to get better. And so some of it is about elevating those that are great mm -hmm. so that we see that there's great work happening there and mm -hmm. we send more and more students to those great institutions. But it's also about the sector getting better. I mean, uh, you know, any entity has to provide a quality service. And if that's done over time, that uh, can be used, I think, then to uh, to improve public support for those institutions. It's not a good short-term idea, and I'll leave that to some of the more politically astute yeah. folks in the audience. Right so. here, and then I'm going to have to break it off, and we'll have questions over coffee after this, where we can all hang out and do it less formally. 
Thank you for having this, first of all. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Jay Marciano, and I work at um, Montgomery College. I think we're one of the 150 um, schools this year. Congratulations. Um, thank you. I have to watch what I say because my boss is here, so I, have to, I feel like I have to oh, filter it out. But one of, the, one of the things I'd, I'd like to ask is um, I'm a counselor there, so I'm meeting with students on their way in. I work with them through and then help them with the transfer. The assessment tools that are used are, I'm going to use the word, deplorable. Um, they, in other words, students come in, they'll take the assessment test, they'll get a score like 60, 80, 120. It's not even based on 100. It doesn't, so here we are telling them this, you know. I think the motor vehicle department probably does a better job after, after you take your, you know, driver's test. So, so anyway, they don't know the areas that they need to improve upon. It's not a diagnostic test. Do you know of any um, community colleges that have, that are using a diagnostic test? And not only that, but they're teaching differently. Because so often, the sk those skill classes, it, it's out of context. You're mm -hmm. teaching skills in a vacuum. So uh, can Go you ahead. please answer? Yeah, so a, a couple of different things. So if you walk onto a community college campus that is working to try to improve student success, um, it doesn't take long for you to hear about their developmental education, remedial education. Uh, co commonly called developmental education in community colleges. There are reforms in that area, and it makes sense. They're the students who are least likely to succeed, and so if you want to up your graduation rates, you've got to figure out what to do with those students. And so I don't think we know yet. Community College Research Center at Columbia University does, I think, some of the best, if not the best, research generally in the community college sector. And I think their, they, their review would say we don't really know exactly what works today, but there are some things that have, we've seen that have really shown promise. So one is the, this idea of co-curricular models. So if students are relatively prepared, you know, if they've got, we're not talking about students with a fifth grade reading level, but students with a 10th grade reading level, you may be able to get them into credit bearing classes and build supports for them alongside that so that they are experiencing something. First of all, they're not re-experiencing high school where for many of these students, they didn't succeed to begin with. We give them the education in the same way and we expect them to succeed. Right, that's the definition of crazy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so so we're, giving, we're letting them take something that's getting them towards their degree, it's accelerating what's happening, and we're building alongside it tutoring, um, co-curricular uh, developmental education. There's some promise there. The second is real acceleration. So the, the, the city universities of New York have a new model where they measure students coming in, and it's a 12 to 18 week boot camp in developmental education. Mm -hmm. And they've shown some pretty remarkable success, including for students that nobody else seems to be able to succeed with. Those who are three years behind, they're able to get a significant number of those in just 18 weeks ready for college level work. And then the final thing is um, that modularized units of education. So one of the things we do, we say you're not ready, you don't know Algebra 2. Uh, well, Algebra 2 is a lot of material. Not knowing Algebra 2 may mean you know half of Algebra 2, not the other half. So w some colleges have thought, well, if we could really assess using a computer assessment what it is students know, then through computerized modules we can deliver just the half they need. We've seen some success, particularly in the state of Ohio. They've scaled that and had some real success. And Tennessee, they've been scaling those kinds of models. So I would say those are three promising approaches. Um, but you're right, that, that the assessment tools are terrible. I do think that um, technology gives us the opportunity to assess and, and, and target education in ways we never could before, and it holds promise, but, but we haven't solved the problem. Yet. I know there are other questions, but let's do it over coffee and dessert. I want to thank you very much thank you. for being here. And uh, the book is, for heaven's sake, read the book, too. Thank you. <laughs>